Back in the early 90s, video game movies were still getting their footing. Super Mario Bros. was first out of the gate, followed by Double Dragon, and just a few weeks after that was Street Fighter. At the time, Street Fighter 2 was arguably the biggest game around. The game was originally released in arcades in 1991 and was quickly ported to home consoles in 1992. With the huge fan base, it seemed like the perfect game to get the Hollywood treatment. While the film didn't exactly resonate with fans as much as they had hoped, it still was the first financially successful video game adaptation, proving that maybe there was an audience for this thing after all. Street Fighter is a 1994 action video game adaptation movie from director Steven D'Souza. The movie opens with a news report in Shadaloo, Southeast Asia. Reporter Chun Li is talking about how the military group Allied Nations is going to defend Shadaloo from the evil dictator and snappy dresser known as General M. Bison. Bison just kidnapped a group of AN relief workers and is holding them hostage for 20 billion dollars. Bison fights some of the soldiers. Well, he kind of dodges their punches and I guess they die of embarrassment. I'm having a hard time being afraid of Bison considering he looks like Mojo Jojo. Chun-Li tries to interview the head of the AN forces, Colonel Guile. Guile uses this as an opportunity to flip off Bison. Bison takes over the transmission to argue with Guile. Although Guile is looking into the camera, how does he see or hear him? Bison sets off a timer saying he wants his 20 billion in three days or he'll kill off the hostages and it will be all Guile's fault. We're coming! Charlie! Charlie! Hang on, buddy. We're coming! Coming. Smooth move, Guile. You just outed your buddy to Bison. Bison locates Charlie, who is conveniently right there, and sends him off to be experimented on. In the seedy underbelly of Shadaloo, Ryu and Ken are weapons dealers, meeting up with local crime boss Sagat. Sagat tries to sound menacing, but his statement could be interpreted as he has no idea what's going on. In Shadaloo City, no one tells me anything. Ryu and Ken try to double-cross Sagat by selling him Nerf guns. Did they think they wouldn't check? Ryu and Ken try to fight their way out of a room that's apparently built with graham crackers. Sagat's men pull out the real guns and capture the duo. How did he forget in 10 seconds that he was holding a toy? Bison and his henchman Zangief go to visit his hostage, Dr. Dalsum. He's forcing him to do these weird experiments on Charlie to make him a killing machine. What's he receiving? See for yourself. Merely educational software. Along with the terrible programming, they inject him with both Mountain Dew Original and Code Red. Sagat forces Ryu to fight in the cage with the underground champion, Vega. Why is Vega choosing to not wear his mask? The whole point is to not mess up his face. Alright, so finally we're gonna get to a fight sequence, and ah, uh, damn it. Guile shows up and arrests everyone. They could have all run away, I'm sure he's not gonna fire those missiles indoors. Guile's in a meeting with his assistant, Cammy. Maybe afterwards he can show her his Thailand. A waiter attacks Guile, but he's easily dispatched. If the guy went through all this trouble to infiltrate the command center, why wouldn't he wait until he was closer to Guile and then stab him in the neck? Or even easier, how about poisoning his water? Instead, he just runs at him, giving him plenty of time to react. In the prison yard, Sagat's men attack Ryu and Ken, which catches the attention of Guile. T-Hawk, where are those two men? T-Hawk? I know it's from the game, but couldn't he have just called him a hawk? Guile has a meeting with Ryu and Ken and offers them a pardon in exchange for infiltrating Sagat's gang to get to Bison. Ryu and Ken fake a fight to steal the handcuff keys. They help Sagat and Vega to escape. Ken shoots Guile, Chun-Li puts a tracker on the truck, and they escape the city. While working on the plans for Bisonopolis, he sees a newscast announcing Guile's death. In Chun-Li's news van with Balrog and Honda, we discover they are more than just a news crew. Does Balrog get his haircut at Blade's Barber? They find out there's someone else with a tracking device on the truck, so Chun-Li dresses up like a ninja to investigate it. She finds the source is coming from the morgue. She locates Guile's body and ah, zombie! Okay, so he faked his death and laid in the morgue for hours waiting for Chun-Li? T-Hawk and Cammy take her to the brig, but she escapes. Chun-Li, Balrog, and Honda are now putting on a magic show for Bison. Hey, that's a genuine Capcom barrel, and inside is what the company plans to do with Mega Man Legends 3. <laughs> Ryu and Ken follow Chun-Li into a tent. Alright, finally a fight sequence, and ah, uh, really? Chun-Li announces she's gonna blow up all of Bison's weapons along with him. Why exactly would she announce this? If she would've just rolled the truck into the tent and blew it up, she would've killed Bison, Sagat, and destroyed all the weapons. Instead, she announces it and gives them plenty of time to get out and have her captured. Bison brings Ryu and Ken into his fortress and gives them new outfits. Guile announces that they're gonna attack Bison. Every time Honda gets whipped, it sounds like they're at a luau. Ugh. 
Wait, is he implying a hand job? Tommy, give me a hand. I've only been in jail two hours. Maybe next month. The AN Security Council tells Guile they're going to meet Bison's demands and for him to call off the assault. Guile instead decides to give a very rousing speech. And I'm going to kick that son of a bitch Bison's ass so hard that the next Bison wannabe is going to feel it. Now, who wants to go home? And who wants to go with me? Everyone's so excited, and this woman forgot how to wear shoes. Guile gets in his super stealth boat to attack from the south, his super stealth boat that has his name printed on the side. In Bison's Lair, oh, I would absolutely love to have that painting in my living room. Bison's listening to Chun-Li while he puts on what could only be described as his pimp coat. Chun-Li's telling him about how he had her father murdered and how she spent the past 20 years chasing him. Bison's rebuttal is legendary. For you... The day Bison graced your village was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. chun Li breaks out of her handcuffs and beats the crap out of Bison. The group comes in and distracts chun Li long enough for Bison to escape. He releases a gas into the room to knock them out, only his sanctuary isn't exactly airtight. Dr. Dalsum starts showing Charlie happy footage so he doesn't turn into a monster. Well, more of a monster. Guile's boat goes into stealth mode and they blow up some of Bison's radar stations. This alerts Bison and they jam their stealth mode. Guile unveils himself to Bison. Alive? Of course! His death was designed to ingratiate his spies with you. I guess you didn't see that, did you? Man, he is just handing out the burns today. One of the guards discovers what Dalsum is really doing to Charlie and tries to kill him. They accidentally release Charlie, now transformed into what looks like a cross between the Geico caveman and a troll doll. Guile breaks into Bison's fortress while Cammy and T-Hawk stay outside to meet with the incoming forces. As the AN deposited the 20 billion in my Swiss bank. I like how his online banking program has a fail buzzer, although I would have went with this one. Guile enters the lab and finds Charlie. Dalsum explains to Guile that Charlie still has some humanity left. Honda gets into a fight with Zangief and, oh, never mind. Guile and Bison then square off. Wait a minute. An actual fight? An hour and 15 minutes into the film, and finally a complete fight in a movie called Street Fighter. It's cut short, though, as Guile easily defeats Bison. Chun-Li and Balrog are fighting their way out, and where did he get boxing gloves? Bison's suit has a built-in life support system that revives him and gives him superpowers. Couldn't he just sidestep to dodge? I guess it's like the game, and Bison's cheap. Meanwhile, Ryu and Ken are fighting Sagat and Vega. Guile kicks Bison and kills him for a second time. DJ explains to Zangief that he's working for the bad guys. Zangief, now a good guy, helps them to escape. So while all this was going on, Dalsum shaved his head? The group's sad because they think that Guile died in the explosion. Cammy's crying, I guess because she can't get him out of her head. Lieutenant, make a note. I need a vacation. Yes, sir. Inside the fortress, Bison is revived again and decides to retry his plan for world domination. But the sequel never happened. The movie was filmed mostly in Australia, Thailand, and Bangkok for about $35 million. A pretty modest budget for such a large production. The original cut of the film had more violence, but they had to remove it to get a PG-13 rating. Ed Pressman, who produced movies like The Crow, Wall Street, and Masters of the Universe, had been in talks with Capcom about the film rights to Street Fighter. Capcom was a little gun-shy about it, since the first two big video game movies, Super Mario Bros. and Double Dragon, weren't received very well. On a tip, Pressman contacted D'Souza because he was a writer well-known for writing huge blockbusters like Commando, The Running Man, 48 Hours, Die Hard, and Die Hard 2. Pressman also heard that D'Souza was familiar with the game Street Fighter. The Capcom executives were returning to Japan the following day, and Pressman wanted D'Souza to write a treatment for the film to show to the executives before they left. D'Souza agreed on one condition, that if the executives liked it, that he would be the one to direct the film. Pressman agreed and D'Souza stayed up all night writing. Capcom liked it, and the production moved forward. That's producer Ed Pressman in a cameo as the Lonely Cook. D'Souza was very familiar with video games in general. He had just produced the game Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, which was an adaptation of the cartoon he also produced. 
On top of that, D'Souza and his son David would frequently go to an arcade near his house to play Street Fighter 2. Speaking of which, here's a cameo from David D'Souza. His father put him in the movie as a thank you for introducing him to the game that ultimately got him this gig. The cast for the film was incredible. You had Jean-Claude Van Damme as Guile, Raul Julia as Bison, Ming-Na Wen as Chun-Li, Kylie Minogue as Kami, Roshan Seth as Dalsam, Wes Studi as Sagat, Byron Mann as Ryu, Grandel Bush as Balrog, Simon Callow in a small role as the AN official, and Miguel Nunez Jr. as DJ. The gigantic Andrew Brunieski played Zangief. While he didn't have a big role in the film, he definitely had some of the best lines. Because he paid me a freaking fortune, you moron! You got paid? Quick! Change the channel! That was beautiful. Classically trained actor Raul Julia was outstanding as Bison. He studied a host of dictators in preparation for the role, most specifically Mussolini. Sadly, just six weeks after the film was finished, he suffered a stroke and died a few days later. This was his last movie, and in the credits, they dedicated it to him. Jean-Claude Van Damme was originally offered the role of Johnny Cage in the Mortal Kombat movie, but opted for the much larger role in Street Fighter. While the movie is a departure from the video game, it's astonishing just how much of the game they managed to squeeze into the film. First, you have this staggering amount of characters in their outfits from the game, and even their haircuts are pretty close, if not identical. Many of the backgrounds in the movie were the same as the backgrounds in the game, like Bison's stage, Sagat's stage, and Honda's stage. They incorporated a lot of the special moves as well. Ryu's helicopter kick and Hadouken, Guile's flash kick, Bison's Psycho Crusher, Honda's Hundred Hand Slap, Ken uses his Dragon Punch on Sagat, and then later we see the scar on his chest like he had in Street Fighter 2. Bison's controlling his bombs with Street Fighter arcade sticks. And not to forget the last shot of the film, which is pretty much identical to the one in the game. Carlos Blanco was two characters combined into one. Charlie, Gal's friend who was in Street Fighter Alpha, and Blanca, the feral savage from Street Fighter 2. Dalsam had chemicals dumped on his arm and head, which is why he was bald in the end. There was a scene that was cut that showed him losing his hair and set up him getting his stretchy limbs for the sequel. Raul Julia improv the one-eye joke. The weapons drop scene towards the end was an homage to Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. The scene where Guile busts into Sagat's lair was an homage to Gunga Din. The DJ heard throughout the film saying, Good morning, Shadaloo. Good morning, Shadaloo is played by Adrian Cronauer, who was the DJ in Vietnam that Robin Williams portrayed in Good Morning Vietnam. A lot of people call the movie unintentionally funny, not realizing that it is intentionally funny. D'Souza frequently injected humor into the film to the point where it's almost absurd. This wasn't a case like The Wicker Man, where Nicolas Cage went and said the movie was supposed to be funny. D'Souza announced that the movie was always supposed to be funny. In fact, he recorded a commentary track for the disc before the movie even hit theaters. The painting that Bison had in his chambers was an alteration of the famous painting, Napoleon Crosses the St. Bernard. He also had a variation of the painting, Pogo the Clown, originally done by the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. And other things like the dialogue. But I think uh, the food court should be larger. All the big franchises will want in. The Godzilla sounds. And the general goofy tone of the film. Game over! Further prove that this movie was made with tongue firmly in cheek. I would have liked the movie to have more actual fighting in it, but that's my only real complaint. In 2003, Jean-Claude Van Damme was working on a sequel, but it never got off the ground. In 2009, the sequel plans were permanently ditched when the film rights went from Universal to 20th Century Fox. Fox wanted to reboot the series and take a more serious direction with the franchise with Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li. While the original movie may not have been the Street Fighter movie fans had hoped for, the reboot was even worse. Street Fighter had action, over-the-top dialogue, and a great sense of humor. Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li had Kristen Kriuk making this face for 96 minutes. Have you lost your mind? No. You've lost your balls. What I